All right. Well, we're a couple minutes past 12, um, so I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about how employers can help bridge the gap for long-term care. Uh, my name is Matt Holden, and I'm an employee, be employee benefits advisor here at Rogers Gray. Uh, today, I'm happy to be joined by Steve Kane from LTCI Partners. Steve has over 20 years of experience with a focus specifically on long-term care uh, and is an is an industry expert in this field. Today, what we're going to do is provide a brief update on the current LTCI marketplace. We'll discuss recent activity and how that's impacting the marketplace. We'll talk a little bit about could impact on the business, the makeup of a typical case and how that aligns with market segments and product solutions. And we'll also talk about best practices for a successful enrollment. Along the way with this presentation, if anyone does have questions, please feel free to use the chat function. And we'll do our best to keep an eye out um, on the chat and address questions as they do come up. With that, Steve, if you wouldn't mind providing an update on what you're seeing in the long-term mar marketplace, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And, and again, appreciate everybody's time for uh, this afternoon to, to talk about long-term care planning. Um, you know, it, it's it's a lot different than what it used to be. I mean, 20 years of long-term care experience, don't, don't worry about the resume here. This just has to do with um, uh, the fact that because there's a lot of legislative activity that we'll talk about, um, I decided to get engaged and involved with different industry groups so I could have my thumb on the pulse of what's going on, meaning I've got access to legislators, lobbyists, and we're having these conversations with those who are planning these types of programs. So you can skip to the next one. Nobody wants to see me. Um, before I get into the, the marketplace update, for those of you who aren't that familiar with long-term care planning and, and long-term care insurance, let me just give you a quick overview. Um, this stuff is hard. You know, This stuff is expensive. I'm not talking about the insurance. I'm talking about a long-term care event. And I'll just give you a real life event. Uh, I'm 49 years old. I'm in that sandwich generation. I've got two teenage daughters and my 83 year old mom lives about three miles away. And mom lives independently, uh, but her mobility is going down fast. Cognitively, she's okay. She's sharp, has a great sense of humor. We spend a ton of time with her, uh, but her mobility is, um, is not great, frankly. And she's got a home health care aide in the house about three days a week. And um, about a month ago, my mom uh, is driving because she's independent and rear ends a senior partner at a national law firm, <laughs> which was no fun, right? I had to get involved. Thank God mom was okay. But you know, immediately the call comes to me. My brothers and I are geographically separated. I'm closest to mom. And I have to drop out of a webinar like this and go to see if, everything, if everything's okay and, and interact with that attorney and the insurance and all that good stuff, take my mom to the doctor to make sure she's okay. And then that led to conversations with my brothers about my mom's independence. Like, you know, should she be driving? Should she be living alone? And it created a lot of strain and stress and these, these situations are consuming. And, and I love my mom and we wanna do whatever we can to keep her independent, but, you know, this was challenging to deal with it. And this wasn't even that big of a deal, right? So fast forward three weeks later, I get a call from my mom's home health care aide, Sandy, who we love. She's like family. And Sandy says to me, hey, Steve, I need more money, right? I don't care if it's more hours, more days, but in inflation is impacting me too. And I need more money. And right now my brothers and I split up the cost three ways. My mom does not have long-term care insurance. I know, terrible sales consultant. Uh, but she was uh, had medical issues that precluded her from securing coverage years ago. Uh, and now we're dealing with it. So Sandy says, I need more money. What do you say as a son, as a loved one? You say, okay, what do you need? Right? That, that's all you can say. My mom loves Sandy. So do we. We want to make sure she stays at home and, and is happy. And so now the cost is going to go up to just over 6000 a month. And we split it three ways. And that's okay. I'm blessed. I make a good living, but not everybody does. Not everybody's in that situation where they could just say, hey, an extra 2000 a month is no big deal or extra whatever a month. But ultimately that's what we're paying. 
And so what I'm here to say is, this is a real issue. It's a financial issue. It's a, it's a family issue that's not going away. And one way to plan for these long-term care events is to get ahead of it and either set aside dollars to pay for future healthcare costs or buy insurance. You know, it's that easy. And what you're looking at on the screen here is just some stats around, hey, will I need this stuff? And we're seeing about half of the population at some point are going to need long-term care. And then, hey, what's the impact on my family? You know, on the next slide, it's pretty significant. Um, I, I can tell you that in, in all honesty, if you ask me, is there any animosity between my brothers and I because I'm doing more of the heavy lifting with mom? Yeah, I'm kind of annoyed sometimes. Uh, you know, frankly, we're okay, but fortunately we're okay. But look, this is what families go through. And so the average long-term care event is about 172,000, but that's the average. You know, we're not talking about an extended long-term care event. If somebody had Alzheimer's or dementia, that could be several years worth of care. Medicare only covers about 10% of all long-term care costs. So about 20, 30 years ago, the insurance industry came up with these long-term care products. And essentially the way they work is if I'm unable to perform my regular everyday activities for a period of 90 days or more, hence the words long-term care, then I receive a benefit that would pay me for the cost of these services home health care, assisted living, skilled nursing. Uh, that's what this covers. And again, the insurance is offsetting the risk, is transferring some of that risk to the insurance company. And they pay me a dollar amount each month to pay for that home health care. So if I'm, my mom owned private long-term care insurance, then we would be able to pay that 6,000 a month with the insurance as opposed to out of pocket. So that's, that's how the insurance works. Um, I, I mentioned 30 years. Matt asked me about the, 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 where the marketplace is today. Well, initially when these insurance companies came out with the products, uh, they mispriced them, frankly. And, and they were very popular products, but they were mispriced um, in, in terms of they thought more less people were going to go on claim than actually went on claim. They thought more people were going to lapse the policies and drop them like we see in life insurance or Medicare supplements, and that just doesn't happen. And so that led to uh, tremendous pain for the insurance companies and frankly, some of the policyholders too that received rate increases. And we saw that market kind of shrink. And we had a number of large group long-term care carriers like John Hancock and MetLife and Prudential and CNA, and I could go on and on. And then one by one by one, because all of them kind of mispriced the first iteration of these policies, said, hey, we're gonna pay these claims and we're gonna honor this business but we don't want to be in it on a forward going basis. And so many employee benefits professionals and HR professionals thought, well, that's it. There's no more long-term care. But what we saw was kind of an evolution um, using different types of long-term care products. So instead of a group long-term care product, it was a individual or multi-life long-term care product. Thanks, Matt. Um, and then we saw the advent of these life insurance products that have dual purpose, where it's a life insurance product with a long-term care rider. And so this is what we've seen in terms of the evolution of the, the industry. We saw a bunch of carriers in the true group marketplace. It was guarantee issue coverage. There was either paper or online enrollment. And then as, as they gained more experience and saw the mistakes that they were making, some stayed in and some got out and, and some kind of flipped it and said, hey, we don't know that we want to be in the traditional long-term care marketplace, the pure insurance marketplace, but we like that life insurance with long-term care, where there's an underlying life insurance contract, whether it's whole life or universal life, and then you've got a long-term care component to these policies as well. So Matt, what are we seeing today? We've got a uh, uh, one um, traditional or multi-life long-term care contract that's out there. Uh, that does offer simplified issue enrollments. Uh, it does offer online enrollment, but that's pure insurance, right? If, if I don't need any benefit, I don't get any money back. There's no cash value built up. And then we've seen the popularity uh, increase for these life with long-term care benefits. And you could see here, there's a number of carriers in this marketplace. Um, I, I'm, I'm under an NDA, so I can't tell you which other carriers are coming in, but I've had conversations with two or three other carriers that are looking to get into both the multi-life long-term care market, the pure insurance market, 
and then also the life with long-term care benefit marketplace. Um, you know, I would say a lot of younger employees are interested in that life with long-term care marketplace because they can envision themselves needing long-term care one day, but they can see having some additional life insurance being important. Uh, so we like those dual purpose policies, but I'll tell you what, the traditional policy might provide you with more benefit per premium dollar, right? Because it's one singular uh, thing that they're trying to cover. Uh, but, you know, what do we do as advisors? What does Matt do? You know, when he's talking to clients, you know, he'll assess the uh, situation, look at the census, see the demographics, the what you're trying to accomplish, and look to both sides of the market, and then come back to you with what might be the optimal solution or walk through, you know, the thought process around what might make sense. But I'm here to say that long-term care is alive and well. Uh, we've got a robust marketplace. No, it's not true group long-term care anymore, uh, but it is multi-life long-term care or life with riders. And given all of the legislative stuff that we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, we're going to see more carriers enter the market in the next couple of years. Um, well, with, yeah, Steve, that, well, with, it, it's great to hear that we are going to have some more carriers entering the marketplace. As you said, you know, over the last, you know, 10, 12 years, all we're seeing is is care leaving the long term yeah, care yeah. marketplace. So now to see that that tide turning is 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 great, and I think it it really reflects a lot of opportunity that's out there and, and need that that employees and 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 people have. Um, yeah. So you did. I was you just did saying, we're the, still challenged. What? I'm sorry, one second. We're still challenged with some products aren't available in these certain states, but. You know, overall, we are seeing more market entrance, but then it comes down to, did XYZ state approve that product yet? And so we play that game and that kind of, that's the, that's the dance that Matt and I have to go through when offering products. Well, we know that all too well here in the Northeast as we tend yeah. to be one of the, the slower states that, that pass those approvals. But um, speaking of state variations, um, and you mentioned legislative changes a little bit. Um, if you could touch on, don't need to go too in depth, but but touch on what happened in the state of Washington, and then what you're seeing for other states, and in particular Massachusetts, um, yeah. where a lot of the folks on this call are located. That would that would be great. Yeah, if you could skip to that uh, map slide. Um, so here's what happened. Um, all of these states recognize that. Medicare is not going to cover people's long-term care, right? So then what happens if people don't buy insurance, if, if they don't have enough money to self-fund this, then who pays for long-term care? Medicaid, right? Which is a means-tested state and federal program that pays for skilled nursing care only. Medicare only covers about 100 days of long-term care in a skilled Medicare-approved facility. That accounts to overall only about 10% of all, long, of all uh, Medicare payments is, is long-term care, but Medicaid can bankrupt the state. Medicaid is where the state says, all right, we got to foot the bill. You know, people didn't do planning, so we're going to pay for it. And so all of these states, unlike the federal government, have to balance their budget. And so the state of Washington years ago said, hey, we need to do something. We need to create a publicly financed program, meaning a tax on employees in the state of Washington that will help us, um, you know, kind of manage our Medicaid expenditures. And so what happened in 2018, 2019 was this started going around saying, hey, we're going to put in a, a tax funder fund, taxpayer funded program where the taxpayers pay a, a portion of their income. And then in the event they need long term care, they get a modest benefit. And that, again, that's a way to kind of save their Medicaid expenditures. And so I, I thought, Matt, there was no way this is going to happen. No chance, no way. We've seen these social programs be talked about before, but nobody could ever get it passed. Well, Washington is one of these states that has a super majority. Uh, trifecta, in fact, you have a Democratic senator, a governor, excuse me, and then the state and House Senate. And this thing became real in 2020 and 2021. So essentially, Washington approved the first of its kind publicly financed long-term care program called the Washington Cares Fund. And what it does is it taxes all employees 18 and up uh, to the tune of 0.58% of their earnings. That could be uh, the, the salary, the bonus, stock options, you name it. 
0.58% of your earnings is going to be taxed starting on July 1st, about a month from now, um, while this person is working, during their working lives. In the event that they need long-term care, they get a very modest benefit, 36500 That's it. So a one-time $36,500 benefit to pay for long-term care. And again, you're paying into this tax through your lifetime. And so other states, when this thing passed, and by the way, it didn't go out to voters. It was a super majority. So the state senators and, and legislators just voted on it and it was approved. And that can happen in many other states around the country. But essentially, they approved a tax that will tax people based on their income and pay a modest long-term care benefit. Fast forward, a number of other states are looking at these types of programs. California, Matt, where I live, has had 18 meetings. They've created a feasibility report. And right now they're pricing out what the tax would be. So at some point in 24, a pricing report and a feasibility report is gonna be handed to the state legislature. And then it's up to the legislature to decide to write a bill or not like in Washington. Now, I, I do wanna step back to Washington for a second. We as an industry successfully lobbied to give us a window in which we can go out and help people buy long-term care insurance. And if they owned long-term care insurance before a certain date, it was November 1st of 21, then, uh, then they would be exempted from the tax. And, uh, and so about a half a million people in Washington ran out and bought long-term care insurance so they didn't have to be taxed uh, with this Washington CARES program. Now, other states looked at Washington and said, hey, we can't afford that. If we're, we're gonna have a big pot of money of a trust in order to pay future long-term care benefits, we can't have a million people opt out. And, and so um, what's likely gonna happen in any of these state programs is that the date the governor signs the law, you know, puts pen to paper, if you owned private insurance before the law was passed, then you could probably apply for an exemption. Those rules are being to be determined, but it's likely that you'll be allowed to be exempted from this program. But if you didn't, on a, you know, after that, you're going to pay the tax. And so we're finding that there's been tremendous activity in the employer marketplace, not just in the states that are lit up here on the map, but all over the country where employers are saying, hey, what do I need to know? Number one, is this possible in my state? And how can I offer something to my employees so that they have an option to exempt themselves from a forward going tax? So let's talk about the Northeast for a minute, because that's where you're at. Um, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, right? Um, all of them are engaged in this issue. Uh, I've talked to legislators and lobbyists in every state. Uh, most recent was two weeks ago in New York. There was a bill that was proposed in New York in 22. And we're just not sure yet if they're going to propose it or reintroduce it in 23, but it is a Washington CARES Fund lookalike. Same type of tax, same type of benefit that's nominal. Keep in mind the insurance benefits that Matt and I have, have distributed throughout the years provide much more benefit in terms of the benefits paid out than a, a nominal state plan, but we could talk about that later. But the bottom line is um, in New York, there's a bill that's written that hasn't been reintroduced in 22. Uh, Pennsylvania, there's a bill that's written that looks like Washington that was reintroduced in 23. We don't have an indication yet whether it's going to get to a committee or a vote, uh, but I'll tell you, it looks, smells, feels, acts like the Washington plan. Um, in the state of Massachusetts, uh, Matt, where you're at, um, a state, state senator wrote a bill saying we need to create a committee or a commission to study this, and that hasn't been voted on, but it will. And, and they will create a commission to study a program like we're seeing in California being studied with the snapshot here, like in Minnesota that you're seeing there. So I, I find that the states in the Northeast understand this issue. They get that it's a big issue and they can't let their Medicaid expenditures take over their state budgets. So they will be looking at these types of programs. When will something be implemented? I don't know. You know, will something be implemented? I don't know. You know, we're keeping our thumb on the pulse and we're talking to all the right people and lobbying on behalf of employers and consumers such that, um, you know, if there's going to be a tax that we have an option to opt out of it and it's not compulsory for everybody, you know, but the bottom line is you're going to see more and more information in the state of Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, 
about these publicly financed programs. They seem to have momentum right now. So I spent many years working for an insurance company, and I know that when these um, legislative changes happen, they, they don't typically take into account the, the time that's needed to no. put to, to actually put these into place. And, and just from prior experience, I know that the volume of business that was coming into carriers um, because of this time crunch and the window that that they give employees or or residents to purchase the insurance creates a real constraint um, and really in certain instances can limit product availability so i would yeah. i'd like to to hear your opinion on you know obviously we Thanks. find value in 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 these programs and in offering them but but why not you know do it now you know before yeah before yeah, it's a and, and like, look, my style has never been like, get it while it's hot, <laughs> you know, the insurance. This is, look, long term care is a, it's a really important, you know, issue, but not many people are that familiar with the insurance coverage itself. And, and it's not like we're seeing clients make a decision overnight when it relates to a corporate long term care purchase. However, I will say our experience in the state of Washington was those who waited the longest to see how exactly the legislation will pay out, had the poorest experience. And it wasn't because of our firm and our capacity, but the insurance industry had capacity issues in the state of Washington where they were receiving three years worth of applications over a three month period. And so that grinded their whole operations to a halt. They weren't ready for the pent up demand. Um, you know, it was either uh, buy insurance or get taxed. And we know what people did in Washington. And you look at those other states in the Northeast, and there are three to four X the amount of working age adults. And so these carriers are saying, well, if something happens, we certainly hope there's not a long window in which people can buy, right? We, we It's likely going to be, and frankly, for these states as well, it's likely going to be a situation where um, the date the governor signs something Either you had insurance before or after. When is the governor going to sign a bill? I don't know, uh, but we're going to be engaged. You know, we're going to be in there talking to legislators, making changes up until the very end, just like we did with the state of Washington. There was a reconciliation process. Matt, it reminds me when I was a kid with the schoolhouse rocks, you know, when a bill becomes a law, you know, I had to get schooled up again and learn how does this thing go through the, each state? And each state has a little bit different you know, rules about how these things pass through. And so we had the ability in the state of Washington to have some influence over the final bill. And it's likely that we'll have some conversations and the ability to change things too. But if you wait until the very end and you say, I don't want to do anything, I don't want to offer anything until I know exactly what this thing looks like, it might be too late. Yeah. Um, we I, I told you Sorry, we actually just had a, a question come through on the chat, which which is relevant to this conversation as well, and and it has to do with portability. Um, yeah. Asking, you know, if I purchase the product um, or the insurance in Massachusetts, but then retire or move to another state, would I be able to retain coverage? And and the answer to that is yes, absolutely. These the products that we offer are fully portable, um, but it does bring up another point regarding the states and different nuances yeah. to um to the requirements and, and what the state will actually pay out so i don't know if you want to touch on that as yeah, well Yeah, in, in washington you know there are, what i've learned is like with all legislation you have to tweak at it over time they got something in there it got approved and and there are some mistakes that they made and some flaws or challenges to the program one of them was portability so i could be right now the way it's it's written it's not portable meaning um, if I'm part of this Washington CARES Fund, I chose not to purchase private insurance, and I'm not exempted from this program, I could pay into this Washington CARES Fund every year for the next 25 years, and then I decide to move to Arizona or Florida, and those benefits don't follow me. And so that was a flaw in the Washington program. I can tell you that all the other states that are looking at these programs are looking at, oh, how do we create a situation where we give people partial benefits? We might not want to give them full benefits, but partial benefits. So I think all these other states are looking at what mistakes did Washington make and um, and how do we not you know, make those as well? Yeah, so I, I look at that as an opportunity for the individual consumer to be more educated about 
what's out there and really customizing a plan fit for them rather than having the state identify what, you know, what's going to be a, a fit for everyone. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I sat through all these legislative meetings and every state that you're seeing on this, on this slide, some more than others, I've met with legislators. I've sat through these committee meetings in California. And I can tell you that everybody on this task force in California is well-intentioned they understand the issue of long-term care. They don't understand policy, you know, or sometimes practicality or feasibility, um, you know, but they understand that long-term care is a big issue. And, and we got to figure out a way to finance this and help residents in that state deal with long-term care events. Um, what I would have preferred in the state of Washington and California is more partnership between the private marketplace and, uh, you know, the, the stakeholders on the committees. But I, I think, other states are looking at it. Like when we try to set up meetings in Massachusetts and New York, we got meetings. Like these legislators wanted to hear from us, you know, about how these programs should coordinate or work with private insurance. And I think the bigger state, the bigger the state in terms of population, the more necessary the private insurance marketplace is. The state can't go at it alone. Washington could because it was small, but New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, California, I think they know going in, we got to coordinate with private insurance. Yeah, so um, switching gears a little bit, um, as we're talking, you know, predominantly about the employer marketplace, um, if you could just give an outline on, on what you've seen in your experience with regards to enrollment strategies, and are you typically doing at renewal and, yeah. and offering and educating employees about these benefits at renewal, or is it an off cycle approach? Yeah. So what works? First of all, like, why would you offer this beyond tax avoidance? Because I, I don't know if these programs are going to move forward or not. There's momentum, but they could take a while. So I still think there's value in offering this now in the absence of legislation to help protect your employees' retirement income, their lifestyles, to manage the long-term care event, frankly, better than my family's managing ours. Um and, and so let's say you get to that point where you say, hey, this makes sense for our group, whether it's voluntary, whether it's funded. Um, how do you successfully enroll a case, right? And, and that's what Matt and I have focused on over the years. And Matt and I have failed enough to know what doesn't work, right? And, and we've had a lot of success in the last several years as well, kind of honing in on the best practices. And what I'll say is, number one, it's got to be off cycle. Nobody understands long-term care. They don't understand it like we do. And so we've got to educate them about the issue and then share with them the tool to offset the risk. And that's the insurance. So number one, off-cycle enrollment. Uh, number two, uh, you need uh, a, an engaged and supportive employer. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, Matt, uh, the employer that we're working with has a personal connection to long-term care. Somebody either in the C-suite, in benefits, somebody is close to the issue and wants to do this. And so what that leads to is their commitment to it being visible. You know, this can't be the best kept secret, you know, in terms of benefits. It has to be a series of emails that go out during an open enrollment period. Um, and then webinars are really important. Now, culturally, you know, some, some companies still feel good about meetings, like getting together with people and doing meetings, and you could accommodate that. Uh, but but we're seeing more webinars live and pre-recorded. These webinars last 20 minutes. You know, you're not doing an hour deep, hour long deep dive. Uh, and then those webinars and the emails lead to one-on-one -on -one consultations. You know, where an employee and and all of these plans, the employee is going to be able to choose what they want to choose. Right? There's usually some bumpers around it. Do I choose the gold, silver, platinum, or do I choose the good, better, best? However you want to describe it. But typically, you've got flexibility in what you can buy as an employee. And so sometimes that requires a consultation, you know, where somebody can guide me through, how does this stuff work again? Hey, if I'm looking at this, what would the price be? Hey, my, my, my spouse owns a Northwestern Mutual plan. Does this replace it or do I still hang on to that? You know, so usually a consultation to endorse the decision that they're making or to um, answer any questions, but I could tell you that Matt, we're not selling stuff. You know, when when people are enrolling, they've got a personal connection to the issue of the employee, or something in their lives triggered their interest in this. They educate themselves via the emails, via the webinars, and by the time they get to the one-on-one -on -one consultation, 
nobody's selling anything. In fact, I feel yeah. like this stuff is bought, not sold. And, and so, you know, those consultations aren't an hour long. They're usually 10 minutes, 15 minutes to reinforce the decision that they're making and help them enroll. But off cycle enrollment, series of emails, uh, live and pre-recorded webinars and individual consultations. And depending on uh, the, the type of group that you are, you know, we get the, the participation results that all the carriers want, that you want, that we want. Um, you know, one thing that I'll say is that this stuff's not for everybody, right? It's not inexpensive and you've got to have a little bit of money to want to protect money and your lifestyle. And so what we're seeing is that the average purchase age in the worksite is 46 years old. Uh, the average income of somebody buying is 75000 And the average premium that this person is spending is between $100 and $120 a month. Now, that's not going to be a complete long-term care solution that would cover 100% of the risk if somebody had Alzheimer's or dementia, but it's a great hedging strategy. It's a great head start. And it's going to take a dent out of whatever long-term care costs. So again, let's use this guy as an example. Again, if my mom was healthy enough to qualify way back when, or her employer offered long-term care insurance and she could secure it, but she didn't want to spend a lot of money. So she went with the $100 a month option that gave her $3,000 a month in long-term care benefit. That would have just cut my cost in half today. I would have been thrilled if mom had insurance and we were co-insuring where my brothers and I were paying for 3000 a month and the insurance was paying for the other three. So that's kind of the way I, I look at this. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And, um, and everyone has a personal experience with this. Um, you know, myself personally, um, my father-in-law um, required long-term care um, really at the beginning of COVID. Unfortunately, he had fallen down the stairs and, was in a wheelchair for the last couple of years and was needed and required long-term care assistance for the um, really for the last couple of years. And, and he had a base plan through his employer um, from years and years ago and an old Unum base plan, which was to your point, Steve, that hundred dollar a day benefit, but that really helped um, my mother-in-law a ton. Um, so I'm curious, are you still seeing employers contributing to these types of plans and are you seeing executive level carve outs or base plan type programs yeah. any longer? I would say, um, yes, the answer is yes. I would say more on the small closely held businesses. Do we see employer contribution or funding? Uh, Matt, I do like the strategy of that base plan where the employees could buy additional. That's a, a symbolic message. The employer is sending saying we care about you, not just during your working years. We want to make sure that, you know, you're protecting yourself. So we're going to buy this and you can buy on top of it. So we are employing that strategy. Um, but I will tell you that it's usually in the small to mid market. We're not seeing it with large corporations, you know, in the thousands of employee uh, space, but downstream, we absolutely are. And one thing that's worth mentioning is the unique and preferential tax treatment of long-term care insurance. So on the federal side, the federal government recognized that they need help. Right, Medicare and Medicaid, as I mentioned, are paying um, the the lion's share of this stuff more so Medicaid than Medicare, and so they created incentives for business owners to buy coverage on themselves and also their employees. So with long term care insurance, you could deduct premium paid for employees. You can legally discriminate or carve out a class of people to offer this to, and the benefits are always going to be income tax free. And so, yes, do we see business owners buying on themselves, a few key executives? You could even buy on spouses and deduct the spouse's premium, even if the spouse isn't working there. So there's just great tax treatment. So when you're dealing with you know, a business that wants to, to fund this, we're always bringing up what the net cost might be after the deduction. Uh, but again, deductibility, discrimination, and tax-free benefit as it relates to long-term care. We did have one question come up in the chat, uh, the chat regarding um, single premium, um, that one-time payment versus monthly premium. Um, are we, are insurance companies still accepting that as like, you know, a single pay or five pay policy? Yeah, in, in the, so, so the way the market is kind of segmented out, you have a, a worksite market and then you have an individual market. In the individual market, meaning they're not corporate rates, 
There, there's not underwriting concessions, but in the individual market, a single premium product is very attractive for affluent people. You know, a lot of people who either inherit money or get a big bonus, just want to knock it out and be done with it. And so Matt, we're seeing a lot of single pay business. You see a lot of five pay, pay to 65. I'll give you an example. I was looking at it, you know, of we, before we implemented a group long-term care plan for my company, I was looking at my own personal planning and we said, okay, let's look at the world of options. We looked at traditional long-term care and then we looked at the combination life and long-term care. And so my wife and I figured the life with long-term care might be a better solution for us at this point in our lives. And we looked at, all right, how do we pay for it? Not just where's the money coming from, but the premium modes, right? And so we looked at a single pay and no way, you know, my, I got expensive kids and wife, no way I could afford a single pay, right? I looked at a five pay and man, that felt uncomfortable. I, I still wanted to golf and vacation and do stuff. No, I looked at a 10 pay. It felt a little bit better right? And then we looked at a pay to 65, essentially making it like a 15, 16 pay. And that's what we landed on. You know, that would be the optimal solution. It, it met our budgetary needs. So with the single premium versus ongoing payments, it, it's always going to be less premium if you knock it out in one shot, but not everybody can or wants to do that. And so I like the fact that we have flexibility for the 10 pay, the five pay, the pay to 65. But again, and then I, I think in addition to that, there was, you know, the question really talks to um, the potential for rate increases um, yeah. with these products. And, and if you could go over just briefly uh, the differences between, you know, a traditional or, or individual long term care policy versus, say, a group um, life with a long term care policy. Yeah. So so the, in, you know, pure insurance right? The, the traditional long-term care products, and there are several carriers that play in that space. We've got a couple to, uh, that offer discounts for worksite, you know, opportunities. Um, the one knock on those policies, now they do give you the most bang for your buck in terms of benefits, but the one knock is that the premiums can go up and likely will go up over time. You just have to go in eyes wide open knowing that, you know, these are, are guaranteed renewable products. And if everybody in the state of Massachusetts gets a rate increase, I would be subject to it as well. Now, today's products are priced with current and I feel more responsible actu actuarial assumptions. So I don't foresee like huge rate increases like we saw in the first generation of long-term care, but you have to know going in that the rates can go up over time. Now, a lot of consumers say, well, I don't like that. I, I want certainty. And, and so in the individual marketplace, you have these hybrid life plus long-term care plans, and those are guaranteed premium. You know, whether it's a 10 pay, a pay to 65, a pay to 100, it guarantees the premium. Now it does bring the premium cost up a little bit because you're combining products and also you're providing guarantees within those products. And then in the worksite group life market, uh, and this is the guarantee issue, uh, life insurance with uh, a long-term care or accelerated death benefit rider, those products are on a universal life or a whole life chassis, and they're designed to, to keep the premium level. If it's a whole life, we know that premium is not going to go up. If it's a universal life, it's likely not going to go up as well. Uh, but if there are changes to the product over time, you might need to monitor it and add more premium over time. It just really depends on the contract. But if you're looking for certainty, uh, there are ways to provide you premium guarantees. Yeah, so the takeaway from that, I, I think, really is is just that we're able to digest all the information that you that that an employer or an, uh, an individual provides us with, and and really can lead them in the right direction um, to help them decide which of these programs is the best fit for them individually. I think that's it. I mean, no no employer's the same, and so what we end up doing is learning a little bit about you and and. What motivated you to take interest in this? Was it a tax? You know, was it a mom situation like me? What was it? And then based on the demographics of your group, we look at the market and see, hey, what makes sense? How would this work? Um, and, and come back to you with those options. That's kind of how we do it. But again, on a consumer level, it's not for everybody. If you're young and not making a, a lot of money, then you're probably not gonna be interested in this. If you're between the ages of 45 and 65, 
it's likely that you've had some long-term care experience at some point, or you're even thinking about retirement planning, and then that's where this would make sense. Yep. So um, really for, and I know we're getting getting close on, on time here. So really for anyone um, that's on this call, uh, Steve and I would love to, to schedule a meeting with you um, individually, talk about your your personal situation as well as the um, your employer group situation and, and see what we can do to, to best help you. Um, so with that, I'm just going to take a look at the chat to see if we have any any final questions on here. All right, I think we are we're good there, Steve. Any anything additional no, you want to share today? Again, I, I like to tell people that like um, first of all, I appreciate everybody's time and engagement, but I like to tell people that um, not everybody has to go out there and run and buy long term care insurance, but everybody should have a plan for long term care, right? And and uh, you know without it, it, it it's a it's pain. It's 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 a financial pain, emotional you know, challenges. We're getting through it as a family, but I, I planning ahead can help. That's all I'm saying. Totally agree. Well, I, I thank you so much for your time, Steve, and, and thank you everyone for, for joining this call today. And like I said, um, please feel free to reach out to us uh, directly. We'd love to have an individual meeting with, with each of you, and I hope you all have a great rest of the day.